Welcome, Rennie. Oh, thank you. So, Rene is a published author, columnist, and runs the Voice for India project, and was born and brought up in New Jersey, and has written a book called India Stripped, where uh, you know, to separate truth from reality as presented in Indian media. So, just with that little background, Rene, we'll start with our first question. Just tell us in your own words about a little bit about yourself and your journey, maybe to towards. Hinduism to set that Okay, going. so um, it all started. I was um, brought up in a Christian um, household and um, during my childhood years and especially my adult life, um, I had a lot of uh, mental um, tortured by the church. Um, they would um, manipulate me and control <coughs> me and um, they would grain in my head that um, I'm going to burn in hell forever and the demons are going to um, attack me, God's going to kill me. So this went on for practically my whole entire life. And then um, in my early adulthood, um, the church really started harassing me and uh, putting a lot of pressure on me um, to be a good uh, Christian um, girl, I guess to say, perfect. So that created a lot of um, anxiety and fear and depression. And um, I actually became very sick um, with extreme anxiety and depression uh, to the point where I couldn't work. I had to take um, almost a year off from work. I was so physically and mentally disabled from how they would torture me and ingrain all these things in my head and um, how they would say that other religions are demonic and um, just hearing that over and over again. So, um, when was this? What time are you talking about? From my whole life growing up in a, ch a uh, Christian. Why would um, they say that? I mean, they, is this routine in the. Um, some uh, sectors are more radical than others. Unfortunately, <laughs> I got stuck in the. I guess, um, radical side, even though most of them preach that, that um, you are going to burn in hell if you don't accept Jesus as your personal savior. So it's kind of a control and manipulation. But at that time, I didn't know because it's just in America that like, everybody's a Christian and you just go to church, you listen to what they tell you. So they just like slowly ingrain it in your head. And, um, you know, if, if every little thing that you do, if you're not perfect, um, you know, they say that the devil's going to get you and all this crazy stuff. But if you don't know any better, especially when you're younger, it really affects you. So that what, what happened to me. Right from childhood, is it? Yeah. And then in my early adulthood, um, I would have pastors, deacons, um, all the, like, the different um, segments of the church, people, the elders, they would come to my house and they would say that I'm a sinner, I'm going to burn in hell. And they would say that you shouldn't go outside because God is going to destroy you. And I actually believed it and I was afraid to leave my house. Parents approved of? Uh, my, my parents are um, Christians too. They kind of believe like on that level too. But I'm talking when I left home and I had my own apartment, okay. but I was a member of this particular um, church in my neighborhood. So they would um, put a lot of pressure on me. I don't know if, um, I guess to be more in the church and make sure that, because they always said that um, you're in this world, but you're not part of this world, meaning you have to live with, among these people but don't act like them. So it was kind of like that, that they ingrained in your head. So um, they would come to my house and, and they would scare the living daylights out of me and say that God was gonna kill me, God was gonna destroy me. So I basically, I was afraid to leave the house to be honest with you. I mean, it was, it was that bad. I lived in so much fear and anxiety 
Um, I couldn't work for a year. I had to go out on disability. I became so sick because I actually believed it because it was like this since childhood where they ingrain all these things in your head. So my um, entire life has been just a horrific journey with the Catholic and the Christian uh, church that I went through and it was just brutal. I mean, one day I went out and I'm sitting in my car and I had my hands on the steering wheel. I couldn't move. I was afraid to go to work. I was afraid to go shopping because I thought once I left that God was going to kill me because I was a sinner. And you know what that feels like? It's, uh, it's torturing yep. in your mind. So I, I went through that for a long period of my time. Oh. We've heard this sinning business earlier with uh, Maria Worth. I know yeah. you know her. Yeah, and we she chat. talked about <laughs> it. I know she talked about it in one of her lectures earlier. That you know we were we all laugh about it, but she said you have no idea that what an impact it has on kids who are being raised in that environment of exactly. constantly being fed. She's sin absolutely and all of that. right. It does so much damage to you. Maybe more than others, but for me, I, I literally went through hell where I, I couldn't even leave my house. To leave my house to go to work or shopping, it was hard. Just sitting in the car thinking that God is going to destroy me because I'm a but sinner. They, but they all the time say God loves you and all of that also, right? Isn't that I, the constant Yeah, narrative like, oh, well? Jesus loves you, but you know, be perfect in Jesus Christ, otherwise, you know, God's going to get you. So, yeah, it's kind of... Um, so, you weren't perfect was, was their problem, is it? Or? Yeah, well, for me, like, um, living as a normal girl in society, you know, wearing jeans, um, you know, if you want to listen to the radio, rock music, like, we weren't allowed to do that. You, you had to wear, like, you know, big clothes, no like jeans or anything like a normal person would wear. Everything had to be Christian music, you know, no rock and roll because it's the devil, no, no secular music because it's the devil. So like everything was the devil, the devil, the devil. And then, you know, when you hear that your whole entire life, the devil, the devil, the demons, the demons are going to get you. Like I was literally afraid to do anything because I thought I would open up the doors and the devil would come in and attack me and I would have anxiety attacks and I would be crippled for hours. That's how powerful it was. And it might seem like to some people, especially growing up in India, because you don't have that type of religion teaching you. So it's it, it might be hard for them to grasp, but believe me, it's really powerful. It's just like kind of what what like ISIS do to their people and like Islam, how they slowly brainwash them and they believe it. So it was kind of like that, I guess to say, for me. So how did it all change? What? Oh my God. <laughs> this was the most, <laughs> yeah. So miraculously, I live in New Jersey and New Jersey has the highest uh, concentration of Indians. So we have a lot of um, Indian restaurants and festivals. So one day I said, I want to go to this Indian festival. I just wanted to see what it like, because I always wanted to go to India. And I always had like this love and passion for cows. Since I was a kid, my, my family, they would all uh, gift me cows at Christmas and birthday. So I went there and this lady gave me a pamphlet on Hinduism and I was reading it and it's so esoteric compared to Christianity. Um, totally different, but when I was reading it, it seemed so practical and so logical and it just made sense. I felt so connected to it, like I wanted to learn more about this way of life, religion, whatever you want to call it. So I started um, learning more about that and like Indian philosophy and meditation and yoga. So it was like a slow process, I guess to say. But from that very moment when she gave me that pamphlet, that day changed my life. How, how long back was that? That was back, um, it had to be before 2006. 
maybe about 2005, early 2006, I'm thinking. So that day for me was a magical day because I, I heard of it, but I really didn't know anything about it because again, it's so esoteric to us in America. But as esoteric as it was, I felt so connected to it. It's like, what is this? This seems like so, like the right way, it's so practical and logical, and there was no founder, and just the whole concept of karma and dharma and everything. So after slowly, slowly, after a long period of time, you know, I started feeling free, you know, and not thinking that if I did something, um, so the devil was going to attack me, and the demons were going to get me, and just going on a full-blown panic attack. So it was, a, it was a long process, but um, then slowly, slowly, I finally got free of the anxiety, um, the depression, the guilt, the shame, and especially thinking that, you know, God was going to kill me. You know, the demons are all coming in. That all went away slowly after some time because I know, like, this was the right path. I, I just <coughs> knew it was. And... It is because now I'm free. I don't feel like that, so. <laughs> Welcome. So, did you start learning yoga or meditation early on? Or? Yeah, this might sound really stupid, but um, because um, the church would say that yoga meditation is demonic and it's evil, to don't do it because if you do it, you open up the doors for demons and the devils, and they're going to come inside of you. So, when they tell you that, you believe it. So when I started learning about Hinduism, Indian philosophy, I wanted to do yoga meditation because it's great for you. So I would do a little and then I would panic and get fearful and then I would stop because I would think that, oh my God, I opened the door to the devil, it's demonic. And I'm like, no, no, I was at war with my mind. It's been slowly, slowly, so um, again, it was another. You were still battling. While you were yeah, but then the next day I'll do it again because because I knew, but I had to push out of my comfort zone, I guess, to say that, you know, that's not true. So little and little and little. And then eventually it's like just like, you know, a slow process like that all, you know, it left and went away. And now I am a yoga teacher in Edison, New Jersey at a that's wellness amazing. center. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it was a long process and it was so difficult. I mean, it's hard for people to grasp that here, but it really is true. You really can be brainwashed like that and how, and... Um, Which is why we wanted you here and, you know, talk a little bit about this other than being a relief. You know, there yeah. are many more who learn. And then I remember my pastor, he gave me this book. I believe his name was Derek Prince. And I still remember that till today. Um, he said that people in India are very demonic. He said as soon as they come out of the birth womb, they're demonic and they're possessed by the devil, right? This was before I knew anything about India coming here, Hinduism. And that struck me as weird, right? I'm like, that seems so prejudiced and such a hardcore statement. Now when I look back, I'm like, the Indian people are the kindest, most gentle, humble, uh, hospitality people in the world. How can he make a statement like that and publish a book like that to put all this fear into people? You know, there's a very popular pastor in Tamil Nadu who actually went on record just a few months back saying that uh, India and Tamil Nadu is the uh, last stronghold of the devil and the temples are, are the place where he resides. This is recent, as recent. Like right I was now. saying the devil, the temples are demonic. Uh, yes, and they're satanic and, uh, and Yeah, that. that's what, and, and I have. And um, he roams around free actually. Yeah, the Christian friends here, they won't go into a Hindu temple because like you said, they think yeah. that it's demonic and it's, yeah. and it's, it's evil. So yeah. yeah, I didn't know how close Christianity here was to Christianity in the West with the, you're going to go to hell, you're going to burn in hell. And like, I don't know if it's like that here in India as it is. Yeah. Um, what is that? 
Yehovah's Witnesses, if I remember correctly. Ah, Jehovah Witnesses. Oh my God, they keep knocking on my door. I'm like, go away. <laughs> I just bumped into them uh, in, uh, in Mahabalipuram, right down south in Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. And in a temple complex and they're coming and giving conversion papers. And I sort of challenge these guys and uh, there's a foreigner there and he tells me I'm here in service of people. So yeah. <laughs> they're so brainwashed that this is service to bring Hindus yeah. out of into Christianity is the only way of service that they ever yeah, imagined. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Good. seems so, like pretty much the same here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So tell us a little bit about, you know, just maybe switching to uh, Voice for India. How did this, ha this happen? A and voice what for India. India. So um, I started a Facebook page in 2012 because coming to India, um, the international uh, mainstream media and even the Indian media, they report all these fake reports, news, surveys, um, that they only want to show the light that India is dirty and negative and it's a dangerous country and it has a high rapes and all these other things. So I knew that that wasn't the truth. So that's when I did a lot of research and my personal experience and I wrote a book, India Strip, because the world needs to know, especially the Western people, that India is not like that. The media does it for their own political agenda. They want to try to brainwash the people in masses that's why I read a lot of blogs and um, on YouTube and um, I read the women saying, oh, I want to come to India and you read comments, oh, you better not go there because you won't make it out alive, you're going to be raped, go somewhere else. So it was comments like that that drove me mad. So I had to write the book, I had to get the truth out about India and, um, and tell the world that India is not like that, it's all just media propaganda. So then I did a lot of research in my book and come to find out India is, has one of the lowest rapes ratio. Like America's like number nine, Norway and Sweden's like one in three. So out of like, I believe 127 countries or 147, I, I can't really remember, India end up like 79 way on the list so it's like i don't really know so much in depth why they're doing that i know that over in um, america we have six big media um, channels so they like to report what they want to report so they're always showing india in a very negative uh, dark light like everything's um rapes and slums and mumbai terrorist attack and things like that so um, that's why I started Voice for India project and also um, I support Hindu equality because Hindus are getting discriminated here and I see that and I feel bad and it's not fair like in this um, Subramaliam temple what happened there um, the Rambirth Mandir temple what happened there and just like certain um, things that go on, how um, the government has control over Hindu temples, but not Christian or um, the churches or the mosque, I should say, but the Hindu temples. Like, where's the logic? That doesn't make sense. Why, why, why are Hindus targeted? How come there's not Hindu equality here when it's majority Hindus? To me, that doesn't make sense. So, and, and, and Bollywood, um, they they make a mockery out of Hindus and it's just really disgusting. So I a big advocate and I support um, Hindu equality. That's a lot of my work and also um, Bollywood, the way they're so disgraceful, how they bash all the gods. So I do um, um, like political videos. I did one on Priyanka Chopra about a year ago. Which got you. Oh God, yeah. that went completely viral, crazy in India and around the world. It gave her a piece of my mind when she said that um, Hindus were terrorists and Pakistan's the victim. So I gave her a piece of my mind. I didn't like that. And that went like crazy viral everywhere. 
And then after that, CNN had said, which really made me so angry, that um, India is the most dangerous country in the world for women, more than Pakistan, Syria, Afghanistan, and all these crazy countries that I could never go to, and I'd never been there. So I was like, that is not true at all. What is this? So I had to do another um, video to slam CNN, and that went viral too. Because I believe if we all get together and, and be a voice, so like Voice for India is not just like, okay, I started. I, I like to get everybody involved in Voice for India because we can't be silent spectators. We must all come together and raise our voices because our voices are powerful. The media is powerful. You see how powerful the media is. So we can be just as powerful as them if we all come together and raise our voice. And every time they say something negative about India or something, we come back and we show them the facts, the true facts about India and keep slamming them back the true facts. Because if they keep slamming India and Hinduism with fake bad news and we all sit around and we don't do anything, then what if we all come together, right, in drones and, and, and slam them back with the good news, then our truth will get out there. That's why I wrote the book. To, so people know the truth about India. That's why I do what I do. So people will know the truth about India. And um, a lot of the people on my Twitter and Facebook, um, they said, I, you are such an inspiration. You such encourage me, you motivate me. So by doing this, I'm encouraging thousands and thousands of Indians to stand up for your Hindu heritage stand up for India. So I'm kind of like a, um, a, a motivational speaker, inspirational speaker to these people because they tell me, oh, they're like, ma'am, you really inspire me. I want to go out and do this. You're really like educating me. So that's why I do what I do to provoke Indians to don't be silent spectators no more. Let's all get together. Yeah, we people Unfortunately, good or bad, we I think there is a, a lot of tendency to act when when people from the West come and tell us something about ourselves, <laughs> we tend to listen a lot more, which is a sad thing in some ways, right? Uh -huh. So, what is your India Connect really? I mean, why? Yes, I can still understand yoga and mm -hmm. you know maybe oh, my, my, my connection with India. You mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, my first visit to India was in January two thousand and nine. And I was just blown away with the people, the hospitality, how they do the namaste gesture, how they touch your feet. Like, you don't see that in other countries. You just don't see it. It's, it has such a meaningful, like, deep symbolic thing to it. And just like, I like the whole atmosphere. I've never in my entire life met the, uh, the nicest bunch of people. I mean, you Indians are the best. I seriously mean that. I've, I've traveled all over the world. I've never seen people in, in, in India with the hospitality and they're so humble. So it's like, it's a, like just a bunch of different things that really struck me. And another thing was the cow because um, like cow's holy. But in America, we're just like, let's take this cow and butcher it up and eat it for meat. But then I like when I was learning, it's like, wow, cow's holy. When he walks across, when she walks across the street, ow, traffic stops. Let the holy cow go by. So I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. So it was like gestures like that. And in wintertime, strangers are putting coats on dogs on the street. So it's like one big happy conglomerate of people and dogs and cows and everywhere and people are looking out for each other you Sounds don't see chaos. that it's what it's called chaos <laughs> <laughs> calm chaos i guess <laughs> so since then you've been to india 22 23rd time now like yeah that's almost this is my twice 23rd a year. time like, yeah, so twice a year you... Yeah, yeah I come okay. twice a year because when I go back, 
I miss India so much. I start crying. Like when I'm leaving, I cry at the airport. And I, oh, what do they call the people that stamp your um, immigration? Yeah, they're like, why are you crying? I said, I don't want to go. He's like, yes, stay, madam, stay. I'm like, I can't, I got to go home. So I just like cry all the time. So I miss it so much. So I got to come back because again, I feel like that umbil umbilical cord is just stuck there for me. Like it seems like home to me. So that's why I'm coming back every um, two I mean, twice a year because of that feeling that I feel like it's so home here and I just like the environment the people the way you know the, the whole like lifestyle here is great and it's lively compared to United States it's so boring <laughs> when I go home I'm still hearing rickshaws in my ear so it was like earn money and then sort of make trips is yeah that yeah yeah <laughs> exactly it takes like a week for the honk honk of the rickshaws to leave my ears when I get home like I'm still hearing all the all the noise and chaos and I like that because I go home and I'm like oh my god I'm in a morgue feels like I'm living in a moor compared to India, so. <laughs> Good. So, on Twitter, I'm going to bring up a little bit controversial things here. <laughs> we were really badly bashed to uh, allow you to come and speak. And the, I, I actually want to put this on record that that's why I'm asking you. Mm -hmm. This is not about naming people or, or, you know, attacking anyone back. That's not the point. Uh, but so the issue was that you did not want the word Hindu or something like that. So do you consider yourself a Hindu or, or no or yes? I mean, just, just for the yeah, record. Yeah, I am. But that particular post didn't mean that, if I could just say that. Please. So can I mention the person's name no. or no? OK, I won't mention the person's name. So I had put a thing on Twitter, and my post was, why do we keep saying Hinduism when the word Hinduism was coined by the British for administration, per to, per, for administration purposes, we should be saying Sanatanam Dharma. So one particular person totally misconstrued that message and said, I said to delete the word Hindu out of the vocabulary or something. But I never said delete Hinduism. I just said, why are we use still Sanatana. saying, yeah, use Sanatam say Dharma? Because to me, they're the same. They're interchangeable because right. they're the same. And actually, every time when I say Hinduism, everybody attacks me. Say Sanatam Dharma. Say Sanatam Dharma. And I'm like, Don't so, listen oh, to God. <laughs> and these sides exist, right? There will be some others who will also tell you that, oh, don't say Vedic Dharma, say Sanatana Dharma. The others will tell you, no, say Vedic Dharma. So there is a lot of confusion. And unfortunately, I know. even when know, I say India, they say, say Bharat. 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 Yes. <laughs> so all this happens, right? So yeah, but just wanted this to sort of uh, mm -hmm. go on record so that there is a there's some clarity about this. So, um, you know, maybe one last topic and then we'll uh, sort of take this to conclusion and, you know, mm -hmm. just a short interview to introduce you to the people and our viewers. So you'd mentioned that uh, when you were working, uh, there were some, uh, you'd put a little Shiva statue when we were speaking earlier before this interview. Can you talk a little uh, bit about yeah. that incident? Okay, so very interesting to at least also. Yeah, talk about. this is a really interesting one. You're really going to want to hear this because you don't hear this anywhere. So I'm a government employee, and I've been a government employee practically my whole life. So I had one um, really prestigious position that I had um, with senators and assemblymen, and um, so one day it was Navratri festival, I believe it was. And I put a Lord Shiva statue on my desk. So some of my colleagues were saying that, um, oh, that thing is putting curses on people. You're putting curses on me. What is that? So it started this big um, thing with management and the directors. So they had called me into um, a meeting and um, I think I might have said that was Lord Shiva because they Googled Lord Shiva. 
it was a Google, like who, like when you Google like a God, you get like all kinds of um, things. So I told him that it was Lord Shiva and I had to explain to a bunch of managers and directors and they publicly humiliated me. I tried to make it simple to them because they didn't really know Hinduism, I'm thinking. So I told them it's kind of like the Trinity, you know, how Jesus is to Christianity, Shiva is to Hinduism. Um, he's not putting curses on people. Um, you know, I said I worship Lord Shiva, so they had a fit. They said, I want you to go to your desk, take your Lord Shiva off your desk, and never bring it back in this office as long as you live. So then I turned around and I said, really? I said, then I don't want to see Mother Mary, Lord Jesus, or Buddha on any other desk. If I can't have Shiva on my desk, then they can't have the right to have their gods on their desk. So um, that put me in a lot of stress. And um, in America, like certain occasions, we go out to eat. So um, I'm a Hindu, I don't eat beef, but I'm a vegetarian anyway. So I would say I don't want to go to no steak houses. And they would laugh at me and make fun of me. They would bring in cows and make a mockery out of me just to like kind of upset me. So it got really out of hand and I was being harassed for being a Hindu. I was being harassed for being a vegetarian. So it came to a point I couldn't work anymore. I had to go out on disability. So um, I end up getting a lawyer and my lawyer says, you have a really good case. He says, we're going to get them on two, um, I don't know the legal term, two um, things of um, religious discrimination and wrongful termination. So I never went back to that um, position. And I'm happy to tell you that because of Lord Shiva, I end up winning the lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, you're, you're, I saw a tweet, you, you're riding Enfield's 350s. Do you ride them or was that just a picture on Enf the oh, Royal Enfield? No, oh, actually, I stayed in a village in um, Bharatpur last time. There's this, um, this children um, foundation there to take care of the children. So it was my friend that's a founder of the organization. So it was his bike. So I just got on and took a picture. And I didn't believe how, I had no idea how heavy them bikes were. Yeah. So I said, I want to get on. I'm like, ah, they saved my life because I would have broke my leg. Had no idea that this bike would weigh like a ton. Yeah. <laughs> so, God. <laughs> Below that shows your fan following amongst Indians. So there was this whole series of people who had posted their <laughs> pictures with their bikes. Oh, my God. Yeah. Everybody was posting, look at my bike, look at my bike, look at my bike. It was like crazy. Everybody was so excited to post their bullet. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much for sharing a little bit of your story with us. Uh, oh, thank you for having clear. me. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>